12, the chapter that seems to go on forever and ever and ever. We're finishing it today. So, yeah, finishing Luke 12. And then next week, Luke 13, if, if we make it that far, right? So, uh, turn to your Bibles there, Luke 12, is we're going to be. Good to be with you, church. Hopefully, you had a great Christmas. Hopefully, you had a great uh, New Year celebration. We look back on this past year. And while there's a lot to mourn and there's a lot to grieve, I think there's a lot to celebrate. I'm, I, I feel like sometimes I'm the only one kind of touting that message that maybe 2020 wasn't the worst year ever, and maybe it was actually the best year ever in disguise, and we'll talk more about that here in a bit. But, you know, some of it, we cope with things differently. We respond to things differently. And uh, someone had talked about on the radio last week, I was listening, and they're talking about scream therapy and dealing with 2020. Has anyone tried scream therapy? You probably did and didn't realize it. Those moments you're in your car and there's no one around and you know, you, maybe you drive by somebody and they're just like, <laughs> only shielded by the windows, only shielded by your leather interior, right? The outside world, you know, they're just humming along and you're in your car just screaming at the top of your lungs. Anyone scream at the top of their lungs in 2020? Yes. Multiple times? Okay, good, yeah. So many people are like, you know, and they were actually on the radio teaching you scream therapy, like this is healthy, and they were talking through the steps of how to hold your, hold your belly and how to appropriately scream, and I'm thinking to myself, is this the best we can do, <laughs> is scream at the top of our lungs, right? Even Iceland yeah. has, has capitalized on scream therapy and in a kind of semi-joking way has advertised the fact that They've got such wide open spaces in Iceland that if you on an app record your scream, they will take your scream and send it out over one of the glaciers or one of the valleys. Anyone want to go to Iceland and just scream your guts out? Yeah, right? I'm going to tell you right now, there's, there's a better way. There, there, there is a better way to respond, to deal with the, the hurt, the, the mourning, the grieving, the uncertainties. There's a better way. And, and I feel like as a pastor, I need to, I need to share this with you as, as a church, as a, as a people who, who, if you want to follow Christ, there's different ways to cope with the things that go on in our lives. I don't want to minimize the, the difficulties that come our way, but I want us to navigate it better than perhaps we have. And I think there's going to be four things out of Luke 12 that I want to show you how we can respond to things with, with perspective. I think we can respond to things with, with an, an eye towards growing and maturing to what God brings us. Because nothing that has happened is not outside of God's sovereign control. Nothing that has taken place is out of God's sovereign wisdom and knowledge. And not that he's the cause of things, but he allows things to happen because he sees an ultimate end. He sees an ultimate objective. He sees things that we don't see. And like we, we just sang in that song, like we want to trust you. And you've given us a million reasons why we can't trust you. Why all of a sudden do we sit there and go, oh, I just don't believe it anymore. Right? Probably because this is something we all feel. It's all stuff we're going through together. And so responding to things is key. And not only is it key to glorify God, but it's key to your growth. And it's key to somebody coming to know Christ as a result of how you respond. Because I'm going to tell you, we were with some, a couple uh, the other night, and we were talking, and I said, I think we as the church, have, we have missed out on opportunities to point people to something more significant, more impactful, more, more substantive, than, than what, what, what we've portrayed for them. What makes you different as a believer? What makes you different as a follower of Christ? Because when you go through all the stuff that we've gone through, you should react and respond differently. And so perhaps Luke 12 has something for us, and, and we're always to keep, keep an eye towards the future because I think a lot, one of the things that Christians have done is we tend, to, we tend to see things through this grid of like end times, and, and let me just say, there's end times madness all around us. Christians, they, we're seen as fanatics. We're, we're seen as extremists. We're, we're seen as argumentative. We tend to spiritualize everything, you know, about the Antichrist and the microchips and this and that. I'm like, stop. Christians, here's the problem. Christians can be so future-minded, they're of no present good. 
I'm going to say that again. We can be so future-minded we're of no present good. Here's what you have. You have the present. We know the future. We know how this ends. Hopefully, if you've, if you've walked with Christ, you know how this thing ends. There's nothing to worry about. We win. We win. question is, how are you going to capitalize on the present to aim towards the glory of God and the good of all people, including yourself? That's what we have before us. Luke 12. Turn there. Some interesting things in Luke some hard passages. We're going to navigate this together, make sense of it. Hopefully, <laughs> with God's help, his spirit here is here among us to teach us and instruct us. So let's look. Luke 12, 49. I have come to cast fire upon the earth. Well, isn't that a good way to start? I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it was already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, and three against two, and two against three, and they will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against mother, daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law, Mother-in-laws are always causes of trouble, aren't they? Amen. All right, so daughter-in-laws against mother-in-laws and vice versa, right? And he was also saying to the multitudes, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a a southern wind blowing, you say it's going to be a hot day. And it turns out that way. Oh, you hypocrites. You know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiate the, uh, be the initiative to judge what is right? For while you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate on your way, there make an effort to settle with him in order that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the constable and the constable throw you into prison. I say to you, you shall not get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts and help us make sense of some interesting passages. But I think, I think there's some powerful things here we need to consider. Responding to different situations. Life is, someone once said what? Life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you respond to it. Right? Life You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to it. My kids, right? You're making me angry. No. No one makes you angry. You're responsible for your anger, right? We're not minimizing what's happening to you, but how you respond is key. First point, responding to distress. Praise God, we have a a pioneering Savior going before us who has experienced distress like you and I would never experience. He goes before us. Hebrew says he is the the anchor. He is the forerunner. He has gone through the whole host of human trials and difficulties and tribulations far greater than we will ever experience. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us, but we have one who has gone through it. Listen to the, the, the language of Christ. This is, this is intense. He, he uses words like fire and baptism. And, and, and we need to understand this because he is literally weeks away from the cross. And that is a distress that you and I will never, ever have to experience. The sinless one taking on the sins of those who need to be redeemed. Can you, have you ever just stopped to take inventory of your own sin in your own life? He's taking on everyone's. Physically, psychologically, emotionally. And he says to the disciples, I am in distress because I could bring fire. Fire in the scriptures is representative of of judgment. It's it's this fire that comes down and it tests and it purifies and it destroys. 
We used to, we used to sing songs, Lori and I were talking about this the other day in our, in our college ministry, and, and, and boy, theologically, sometimes we can sing some really, really bad songs, right? Oh, 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 let the fire of God come down on me. Are you, are you sure? <laughs> you, you want this? We don't know what we're singing, right? Like, oh, Lord, pour out your fire on me. I'm like, no, you don't. Because it tests, it purifies, it destroys. God has said he is going to destroy the elements. He's going to bring a fire of judgment upon this world one day. And Jesus says, oh, I, how I wish it was here. And here's the reality of it. God can bring this fire, destroy every single one of us without saving us, and he would be totally just and righteous to do that. But before there's fire, notice the word baptism. Jesus says, rather than God destroying everything and saving no one, he sends his son on a mission so that the son undergoes a baptism of judgment, a baptism where he's immersed in our guilt and our shame, and this is symbolic. This is representative. This is the perfect s substitute for us. He takes our sins so that when God does judge the world one day, he's going to spend eternity with some of us because of what the son's going to undergo through his own baptism. You ever thought of the cross as emblematic of a baptism? He's baptized in our guilt. He's baptized in our sin. And here's, here's where we just raise a voice to the, the grace of God and the mercy of God, and we say, God, thank you. Hallelujah, what a Savior. That rather than condemning us to eternity apart from the love of God, Christ immerses himself in this baptism of death where he goes to the cross for us, and he says, I want you to be eternally secure in the Father's love. That is amazing. That stops us in our tracks. The fact that God's fire is delayed. It's delayed because he is, he is a kind and long-suffering God who says, today's the day of salvation. The fact that he hasn't brought fire yet is because he still wants people to know him. He so wants people to, to, to come to the cross and see that the cross is a symbol of judgment and a judgment we deserve, but the Son takes it. God has every right to judge the world, but instead of judging the world first, he, he judges the Son with the sins that I deserve to be punished for, but the Son takes it. Think about how incredibly wonderful and humbling this is. And Christ says he's looking forward to this baptism. You see how devoted he is to your salvation? How devoted he is to say, I want to redeem you. I want to save you. I want to reconcile you. I want to pay your debt. He's devoted to that. This is the, the language he uses, right? I have a baptism to undergo and I am distressed. I'm going to feel it. The Garden of the Gethsemane was just a, just a surface view of the anguish and the agony that he would be devoted to. Why? Because he had to redeem himself? No, he had to redeem us. Wow. Some of you are going, how can he look forward to something like this? It's the same way a pregnant woman can look forward to her labor. Amen, ladies? She's eager to get on with it, right? She's eager. It's not that the labor is pleasant or enjoyable, but she endures it. Why? Because of what will result from it. Life. Joy. And that's what Jesus embraces for us. He's going to carry our sin. He's going to carry our pain. He's going to carry our punishment. The judgment that belonged to me is now carried by him. And ladies and gentlemen, this sets Christ apart from other spiritual leaders. This sets Christianity apart from other world religions. Don't tell me that all of them teach the same. They don't. 
This is what's so unique about Christianity and Christ. It is the cross. Frederick Beekner, and I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't know Beekner, is, I talk a lot about Lewis, but you need to know also about Beekner. Beekner is an incredible thinker. I'm going to, I'm going to try, my, my, one of my resolutions is to give you less Lewis, more Beekner this year. <laughs> but look at Beekner and how he says, Buddha sits enthroned beneath the bow tree in the lotus position. His lips are faintly parted in the smile of one who has passed beyond every power on earth or heaven to touch him. Right? He's come to this place of, of total, like, consciousness. Right? Just... Just almost like levitating above the world. Nothing's impacting him, right? He, and, and here's what Buddha says, right? He who loves 50 has 50 woes. Minimize the loves. He who has 10 has 10 woes. He who loves none has no woes. The Buddha says don't love anything. Because love only brings hurt, pain. His eyes are closed impervious, immune, disconnected. But Christ is the opposite. And, and whether we're talking Buddha or Socrates or, or Mohammed or Oprah or whoever you follow, Jesus is different and says, I'm not going to close my eyes because there's pain. That pain is a result of sin. And I refuse to close my eyes. What I do want to do is I'm going to embrace the world's woes. He who loves the world takes on the world's woes. And this is what Christ does. Buddha's eyes are closed. Christ's eyes are open. He sees the hurt. He sees the pain. He weeps. He grieves. He mourns. He hurts. Why? Because he's not a God who's disconnected. He's a God who enters our pain. And I will tell you, he is the sin-bearing, sacrificial, substitute savior for us. And no other spiritual leader, religious deity can claim that title. Sin-bearing, sacrificial, substitute savior. That is awesome. Every other religious figure loves from a distance. This is the only God who comes up close and not only so close where he can touch us, he's so close where he is baptized in our sin and guilt and shame. Man. So when it comes to my distress, I have a high priest who says, I've gone through it. And by going through it, he has led the journey to victory. And now when you go through distress, I'm not saying you're not going to go through distress. Christ never promises that. But he says when you go through it, you need to know it's not meaningless. When you go through it, you have company. When you go through it, you have a companion. This is why the psalmist, right? Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know you're with me because you're my shepherd. You know the way. I can trust you. Your rod and staff, they protect me and comfort me because I know at the end of the journey, there is a table set in the wilderness that it's going to be a banquet that I've never, ever tasted before. Feeling distressed? Here's how you respond to it. I know my Savior leads me. And he will never lead, lead me. And he will never leave me. He's gone through it, you guys. Hallelujah, what a Savior. That's why we celebrate communion. There's times I sit there and go, why aren't we like screaming, talking about scream therapy? Why? <laughs> oh, what grace. Distress, maybe you feel it with the second point, responding in our divisions. Jesus shifts and says, I'm going to accomplish something, but if you're going to be connected with me and identified with me, you need to understand it's going to come at a cost. The cost could be breaking 
the most intimate bonds you've ever had, and that's with family. We were just talking just uh, earlier about how difficult, difficult it is to be with family sometimes. Anyone get it? I don't hear an amen to that one. Yeah, yeah. especially the, some of you are like, I'm so glad the holidays are done. Don't get to be with family anymore. But, you know, b- the bond of family is, is it's the most intimate bond in the world, and yet Christ comes and says some pretty interesting things. He's going to cause division among the most intimate bonds. He's going to demand uh, an allegiance that may mean you're going to love God more and it's going to look like hate to the world towards your family. Right? You, you ever wrestle with what Jesus says? Like, if you don't hate your own father and mother, you can't be my disciple. And we sit there and go, what it is, it's a Hebrew idiom that means your love for God is so great, it almost looks like hate towards your family. Here's what Christ says. He says, I'm going to come and I don't bring peace. Now, it's interesting, right? But I bring division. The peace Christ does bring, because look at John 14, verse 27. He says this, there is a peace I do bring, and it's not the world's peace, right? Not as the world gives you, do I give you. Let hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. There is a deep peace that Christ does bring, but it goes beyond human relationships. Sometimes, you know what, you need, a, 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 you need to be concerned not so much about what others think about you, but be driven by what God thinks about you, what God's called you to. Because people aren't going to agree. People aren't going to, they're not going to, they're not going to see it as you see it, right? The Christian's perspective should be like that of the Apostle Paul, where he says, you know, the pains and trials of this life are nothing compared to the joys that are, that are going to come and that are promised to us. I'm going to make a statement. I want you to write these two words down. Price and prize. And here's the statement. Price and prize. Jesus never minimizes the price of discipleship because of the magnitude of the prize of discipleship. If Christ is your prize... If he is your treasure, if he is your all in all, there is no price you are not willing to pay to get that prize. Comprende? Say, comprendo. (laughs) That's as bilingual as we get around here. If you understand Christ as the prize, there is no price you won't pay to get that prize. See, the cross challenges people. Jesus doesn't come and, and, and not communicate challenging things. There's, here's the crazy thing with Jesus. There's no middle ground. Don't you wish there was some middle ground with Jesus sometimes? Like, Jesus, where's the gray area? He only colors in two crayons, black and white. <laughs> Jesus says, loyalties are to be made commitments are to be declared and when you accept christ sometimes you need to understand it is almost like an all-out declaration of war in this world and so the church experienced this early on you have to understand that when people came to know jesus first century if they were jewish they were excommunicated from the synagogue They were alienated from their families. And as painful as it may be, the prize was greater than the pain of being disconnected from people that they loved. Today, it happens around the world. We read of people in other places. It's not so much seen here, but it is seen in cultures where there is such an allegiance to uh, Islam or, or Buddhism that when a family member comes to accept Christ and and, and embraces the, the tenets of Christianity, they are excommunicated. And men and women today writing of the pain, but the, the price being so great. Ladies and gentlemen, following Christ is not easy. It is not comfortable. It comes at a great expense. Even Micah chapter 7, verse 6 
talks about the fact that you are to expect division, right? Here's what Micah says. Sons treats the father with contempt. Daughter rises up against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Micah prophesied 700 years before Christ of what the coming Messiah would do, right? Expect division. There's going to be conflict. The cost of following Christ is high, and sometimes that, that opposition comes from those that we love. I remember vividly, I didn't grow up in a, in a Christian home. There were two camps growing up in my household. One side of the family, atheist. The other side, agnostic. And it was amazing that the grace of God even found our home. And there were neighbors that loved us. And they invited my, my parents to, to church here, here in the valley, 1983. My mom and dad accepted Christ as Savior and Lord. And you've heard me talk about this, where my mom and dad, man, they love playing bridge. They love going to concerts. They played the music on 11. They, they were just, they partied, right? And, it was, and I remember growing up, it was bridge and box wine at my house. And then it turned into Bible studies and juice. And it was like, and I remember the first time we went to visit my grandparents my, on my dad's side, staunch atheists. And I remember them telling my grandparents that they made a decision for Christ. I was 13 years old. And I remember my grandfather tearing into them and yelling and screaming to the point they kicked us out of their house. And then the following week in the mail came a folder this thick and it was a it was a typed out document from my grandfather of why Christianity is a sham, Jesus Christ is a lunatic and none of it's to be believed. And my mom is reading through this and tears are soaking the pages. These are her in-laws. This is my father's parents attacking this new found faith. And I remember the conversations. I didn't know Christ at the time, but boy, I knew something serious and radical was going on. And it took years. After my mom's death, she died at 39 years of age. I was 15. That's when God saved me. And I, I carried on the tradition, not the spiritual gift of, of opposition, but realizing that th there's an association with Christ that when I see my grandparents, I'm going to bring this up with them. And for the next 25, 30 years, conflict, opposition, arguments, fighting, debate. We never, we never wrote them off. They never wrote us off. And how desperately we, as, as one by one, their grandkids are converting to Christianity. I think they mellowed out over the years, but they were still in their hearts this rebellious and stubborn and angry. I remember, I was like, wow, is this, is this what following Jesus entails? That, yeah, your families may have a rule like our family did. Don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion. We're all good. Well, guess what? Christianity doesn't allow there to be that agreement. I'm not saying you have to be a jackass about it. <laughs> right? You can be truthful but tender. You can be godly but gracious. You could say hard things in humility. Watch what God does. He, he may bring about change. But I'll tell you what, Jesus is offensive. Especially in pluralistic environments. Can you write that down? Jesus is offensive. I'm going to tell you right now, he should be offensive to you. Because what he does in my life is oftentimes he offends my supposed sensibilities. He's a God who offends, and that's a good thing. That's why major news stations and periodicals and social media platforms will not allow, and they're getting more severe about this, two words, Jesus Christ. They're policing, they're patrolling. Why? Because everything else is fair game. 
But when you mention Jesus Christ, that's an editorial judgment or an offensive position. Jesus did not come to tell people that all paths lead to God. He did not come to tell people that what you believe does not matter. He did not come and believe that all people are good or espouse the perf perfectibility of all humanity. He did not say that you can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone else. He demands careful obedience. He demands costly loyalty. Here's my question to you, 2021. Are you ready to face disapproval out of your desire to follow Christ wherever he leads you? Even if it means being disapproved by your family. Again, you don't seek to be disapproved, but by the manner of your allegiance and where your heart leads you, it may happen as an indirect result. And are you ready for that? And perhaps we don't respond to current situations because we, 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 we don't take our allegiance to Christ seriously. Christ demands ultimate allegiance. Everything else is secondary to him. Point three, responding with discernment. This is really something I've seen a lack of among evangelical circles lately is this. We don't know how to discern the days. And again, this is where some of that end times madness comes into, into view. Right? This, this idea that, you know, everything has to be seen through the, the grid of the Antichrist and the, the mark of the beast and, and this and that. Most Christians don't know how to discern reality. And, and if it's not even an extreme end times view, it's just making sense of just daily living discernment is huge or ought to be sometimes we get consumed with interesting things but we miss the important things if only we were great at discerning the will and work of god rather than the things that are not eternally important we would be different so what does jesus say look at verse 54 so he's talking about his distress he's talking about the division now he's talking about the fact that these these people are great at discerning the weather. I'm going to tell you right now, easiest job in the world is to be a weather person in Arizona. Amen? <laughs> you get warm or hot. Right? You get sunny or blistering sunny. I mean, that's really it. I'm, su I'm surprised so many people make a career out of being a, 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 a meteorologist or a weather person in Arizona. And yet we all stay up and watch the weather, don't we? It's like, I wonder what it's going to be tomorrow. Guess what, dummies? It's going to be sunny. We live in Arizona. In summertime, it's going to be hot. There's hot, there's warm, there's hot, and there's hotter. That's it. Jesus says, these people are good at discerning the weather. See, in the Middle East, they knew when, when there are clouds forming on the, uh, from the west, it was coming from the Mediterranean, it brought rain. When there's the Shirakos, right, the, the suddenly warm winds that came from the south, they knew it was going to be hot, dry. Not unlike what we experience today, right? We know when there's thunder clouds building out there. It's like, ooh, monsoons. It's like, well, good job, meteorologists. But he says, but you're so good at discerning the weather. How are you with discerning with what the kingdom of God's doing? Look what he says. He says, you can see the clouds. You can see, hear the winds and see the winds. Why do you not know how to analyze this present moment? Because there's something greater among you guys. See, Jesus is there. Everything that their scriptures had pointed to, everything that these Jewish men had been taught, everything that their ancestors had, had educated them, them on. See, there was no excuse for them not to see, and yet they didn't discern what was right in front of their very eyes. They miss Christ. Can I tell you right now? We miss Christ. We have more available to us than any other generation ever and we still miss christ they miss how the kingdom is here we miss that they were so good at reading earth's winds they were failures at reading the spiritual winds that were beginning to howl they were so shrewd in earthly matters that they were dunces in spiritual matters they came to the wrong conclusion about jesus and god's work in this world can i tell you it's happening right now around us we're coming to the wrong conclusions. Why? Because maybe patriotism has clouded our vision. Can I get an amen from somebody? We call the so-called experts. You know, we need to stop listening to the experts. 
People might have some good things to say, but we put too much stock on the experts, whether they be medical experts, whether they be political experts, even spiritual experts. Why? Because they are discerning the times incorrectly. We need to start thinking for ourselves. And by that, I mean stop just accepting what people say and people repost and retweet and requote. And I sit there and go, do you even know what's being said? See, we don't need people telling us what to think. We need God to teach us how to think. You, may I remind you, have the mind of Christ. Can someone tell me what's better than that? What do you need? What are you crying for? What are you, what are you clamoring about? If you are a believer in Christ, Paul says you have the mind of Christ. Couple that with the spirits present in your life. So if you're a believer, you have two things. Write this down. You have the mind of Christ and you have the indwelling spirit. I'm going to think to myself, that's a recipe for success. And yet we sit there and go, I need more. I need some experts to help. No, you don't. You don't need me. You don't need some other spiritual leader. You don't need, you need to be a believer in Christ that says, I have one source for objective truth. That's the word of God. I have one expert that needs to speak to my life, and that is God. And because I've been given the mind of Christ and the spirit of Christ, I can make sense of these days. May I remind you, here's a few verses. Get your pen ready. Stretch your fingers. Here we go. Check out these verses. Acts 17, 11. Here's what's so great about the Bereans. They were examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. With everything that goes on in your life, you should begin to mature to the point where you are able to attach it to scripture. The most important things in your life should be dictated by scripture. And not just, oh, so pastor, so-and-so said this. I don't care. Does the word of God say it? Humans are fallible. The word of God is infallible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly, foolishness, right? So the moment you go out and say, here's what the Bible says, someone who's a non-believer is going to go, foolishness divisions right he is not able to understand them because why they are spiritually discerned the spiritual person judges all things right we need to be the ones that say this is right this is wrong this is good this is evil right because we ourselves are being to be judged by no one for who has understood the mind of the lord so as to instruct him but we have the mind of christ first john chapter two John says this, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. And let me just tell you, the forces in our culture today are out to deceive you. Don't misunderstand it. Right? There are, there are, Ephesians 6, we're coming back to this, don't worry. Ephesians 6, your battle is not against flesh and blood but against the unseen forces. There's a spiritual war going on today, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to be aware of. The anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, what has God left out? Nothing. Nothing. What is he teaching us about everything? And is true and is no lie, just as it is taught you, abide in him. An undiscerning Christian is a non-abiding Christian. You have been given the mind of Christ. You have been given the indwelling work of the Spirit who, according to John 14, John 16, has been given to you to teach you, to guide you, to instruct you, and to bring you into all the truth that Christ has already elucidated. Woo! Guys, there is no excuse for us to buy into some of the stuff that this world is espousing, and especially some of the stuff that the, the evangelical church is espousing. 
quit trying to hijack the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, talk about flying scorpions and dragons and nuclear this. And, this. and here's what you are to do. You are to clothe yourself daily in humility. And you are to clothe yourself daily in love. And you're to clothe yourself daily in grace. And you're to clothe yourself daily in kindness. And you're to clothe yourself daily in mercy. And you're to clothe yourself daily in wisdom. Because that's the character of Jesus. You're not going to convert someone by how well you know the end times. God will use you to change a person's life when you embody the spirit and character of Jesus. Be sober-minded. Be reasonable in your thinking. Be kind. Because it is the kindness of God that has led you to repentance. Point number four. My resolution was to yell at you guys more. 2021. <laughs> Be kind. I've gone easy on you guys. Responding to or with diligence. Responding with diligence is the last one. So notice what Jesus says. So he says, I've come and I'm going to experience this, this, this stress for you. If you're going to associate with me, it's going to bring division to your relationships. But with, when you're with me, you're going to be a discerning person. And you're not going to be the chicken little kind of Christian. You're, you're going to be a, a Christian who is bringing to the table some, some reasonable thinking, some, some gracious challenges to what the world wants, to, wants you to believe. But you also need to understand something about the fact that the end is coming. And it would be wise, it would, it would be wise to be diligent in settling accounts, not only with God, but with other people. Notice how Jesus finishes this section. He says, the end is happening, and there's going to come a day when you are going to be dragged because you are a debtor. And you're going to be dragged before the judge, and you're not going to have a single cent to pay that fine, that penalty. And you're going to be cast into prison. Here's what Jesus says. It would be wise to settle accounts before you even get to court. Two things Jesus has in mind, I believe. One is this. Today is the day of salvation. Accept the penalty that has been paid on your behalf. Amen. Amen? The judge has already declared the verdict. You're guilty. But what you don't know is that you have an advocate there representing your case in that court that we call the court of heaven. And if he's that judge not only renders the verdict guilty, he's also the judge that takes off his robe and comes down and stands beside you and says, I will pay the price that has come down from you. Be forgiven by God. Let his judicial act of grace be the payment that you need because guess what? If you want to try to pay that bill on your own, good luck. It's never going to happen. For all fall short of the glory of God, right? Why? Because we are sinners. And sin enacts a great debt. You know what? You know, the, if you don't want Jesus and you want to do this on your own, here's what it requires. Perfection. And guess what? You've all failed in that today. Including me. That's why we need a sin-bearing, sacrificial, substitute Savior who was perfect, who though he became sin for us, he himself knew no sin, so he became the perfect substitute, paid the perfect price that you and I were powerless to pay. And if you've been forgiven and freed from that debt, you now go forth and settle accounts with people because as you've been forgiven, you now forgive people. Forgiven people are forgiving people. To know that I am forgiven by God, you don't, know, you don't know what kind of song and dance that creates in my soul. 
to know that I, I know what kind of sinner I am. You guys are going, oh, not you, Pastor Scott. Oh, yes. And to know that as I abide in Christ, while he is continuing to work that sin out of my life, here's the thing that keeps me buoyed up every single day, is that my life has already been approved because of Jesus, and now I don't have to seek God's approval. Through my performance, through my perfection, because I'm not that. But to know that I have been forgiven, and he loves me as I am, where I am, but he promises to never just leave me where I am, he's going to make me into the image of Christ, I, that weight, every single day, it just continues to get lighter and lighter and lighter. There's no burden. Because he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, he says, and my burden is light. The cost of following Christ may be expensive, but living under the burden of your sin is even more taxing. Settle the account today with God. Because he's calling you. And he's saying, yeah, Zach Topolsky, um, we see an outstanding um, liability on your account in the amount of quadrillions and quadrillions and quadrillions of dollars. When can we expect payment from you? Hangs up. They call in a different line. Oh, I don't recognize this number. Yeah, Zach! Thought you could avoid this, huh? Every single day, men and women live under this sense of, when am I going to get that call? We live under the burden of our own sin and guilt. And Christ declares to us, come to me today and have that payment cleared. In Christ, there is no condemnation. In Christ, there is no sense of, oh, great, he's met me halfway, now i got to meet him halfway. He's done it all. And on that cross declared with three perfect world words, it is finished. Is it? <laughs> is it? Because you need to start living as forgiven people. And in your relationships, be a forgiving person. Because the end is coming, and if you haven't only not only settled accounts, with, settled accounts with God, you need to begin to settle accounts with people. Because you don't want to die and enter eternity with unfinished business here on earth. Because it's your act of forgiveness that may be the instrument where someone knows the forgiveness of God. As you've been forgiven, you go and forgive. read an obituary the other day because that's fun <laughs> kids written for their mom and essentially the obituary said this so and so died and we're glad she's gone she walked away from our family had no relationship with us and now she shall be judged in hell for eternity good riddance can, can you imagine reading that do not leave your earthly relationships in that sort of condition I feel I feel for the life of anger and bitterness those children have that only the grace of God can even bring comfort to. Man, there's, there's a lot of hurt out there, you guys. Praise God, he has met us in that hurt. And he's met us in that pain. Hopefully today, we have seen from the passage before us ways we can approach this year differently. Perhaps I've, I've maybe changed your perspective change your, your pattern of how you used to go about things, we're always going to point to Christ. We're always going to listen to what he has to say, no matter how much it hurts. And I'm always going to encourage you and pray for you to live more like him, 
who you claim to know and love and believe. Let that, let, let his, his influence and impact change your life. Because he's going to do it. And all God's people said, happy 2021. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for this church community. Lord, proud to call this group family. Lord, thank you for today and just a chance to rejoice, a chance to say thank you, a chance to just bring you praise and honor and glory. You have blessed us. You have stepped into our lives and given us a gift that is truly indescribable, inexpressible. Lord, and while we may fall short of the words to express our gratitude to you, Lord, our spirits, our souls, we feel it, we sense it. Thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. Thank you for giving us an eternal commitment that you will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, may we be the people that now lead, lead our lives seeking to glorify you and seeking to lead others to Christ and show them the beauty of the gospel. Lord, empower us, direct us to, to, to live in that manner, in that spirit. Lord, thank you for loving us for this moment today to enjoy you. Thank you for just the, the sacrifice of Christ that makes all this possible. Lord, to you be honor and glory and praise forever and ever. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give his grace and peace forever and ever.